first and foremost, I'd like to thank you for coming on the show. I, I greatly appreciate you sharing your time and your knowledge with us today. My pleasure. I'm tired. Hey, can you hear me okay? Or should I put my earpiece in? No, we can hear you just fine. Okay, great. We can hear you just fine. So, yeah. So, um, you know, briefly, I know you you talk about this quite a lot. Um, you know, you have a whole, we can even say revolutionary way of thinking about training. Can you kind of give a synopsis of what, like what your uh, thinking on training kind of consists of? Sure, absolutely. So um, I, I think I'm sort of starting like in the middle of this thing. I'm sorry to those people that don't know anything about my background. I've been, I've been competing and bodybuilding for over 40 years. It started when I was 16, but I was always very analytical. So I was, I was the kid that was taking apart the doorknobs and the clocks and just wanting to know how they work, why they work, you know, mm -hmm. what the mechanism is. So when I started bodybuilding at the age of 14, I right away started, you know, trying to figure out, never thinking I was going to actually do anything with that knowledge. I was just curious. Mm -hmm. um, and I was doing a lot of experimenting and asking a lot of questions. And then eventually I started reading and eventually I started doing cadaver dissections. And the fundamental thing is this, when you're bodybuilding or when you're strength training, um, you're challenging those muscles to do something, to get bigger, better, stronger, whatever. And there's a lot of mistaken assumptions that happen along the way. Primarily the most common uh, misconception is that the heavier weight you lift, the more your muscles are loaded and the more you'll get stronger. But that completely ignores the fact that lifting weights is a mechanical thing. And so there's physics principles involved in there, right? So um, a muscle might be loaded with 90 pounds of resistance and that's all it knows. It doesn't know whether because of the physics of this particular exercise, it's getting 30% of the 300 pounds you're lifting, or it's getting 90% of the 100 pounds you're lifting, right? So hmm, either way, the muscle only knows 90 pounds and it's only gonna to respond to 90 pounds, right? So I'll give you an example of percentages. So if you were to put your arm in a tabletop with your elbow bent and your forearm vertical, you could put a 50 pound dumbbell in there, you could put an 80 pound dumbbell on there and your bicep would still be relaxed as would be your tricep because this is in the neutral position and this is the lever being operated by the bicep or the tricep. Now, if you took that 50 pound dumbbell that you could so easily hold on the tabletop and try to stand with it like this, you'd never be able to do it. Oh man, maybe a 50 pound might, you might be able to, but because once that form gets horizontal, that is a fully active, quote unquote, active lever. So this is a, a neutral lever vertical, parallel to gravity, support beams, pendulums, you know, on a clock, mm -hmm. neutral, right? Horizontal, perpendicular to gravity, maximum. So in between a 45 degree angle would be, just for the sake of simplicity, let's just say 50% as mm -hmm. active as it would be horizontal. I mean, you have to play with some trigonometry if you wanted to be exact, but the point is it's more than this and it's less than that, right? It's somewhere in the middle. So um, when you're doing a barbell squat, your lower leg is the lever being operated by your quadricep. Your upper leg bone, your femur is being operated by the glutes. And your torso is also a lever that's being operated by primarily your erective spinae uh, and to some degree the glutes. So when you're in the standing position, all three of those limbs, all three of those levers are in the neutral position. You could have 400 pounds on your back someone could come up and tap you on the quadricep and it would be completely relaxed mm -hmm. because it's the lower leg is still neutral. Okay. As soon as those limbs start to move from the neutral position, they start entering percentages of activation, percentages of load. So when your lower leg goes to 30 degrees, you could argue that it's about 30% as active as it would be if it was completely horizontal, right? So that means you're getting basically a 70% reduction of what it would be if you had a totally efficient lower leg lever. And mm -hmm. that reduction compels you to add more weight to the bar to compensate for that reduction. But that is a cost. It has an increased energy cost, increased compression cost on the spine. And so it's not the smartest way to load the quadricep more. And you could say, excuse me, I don't mean to- No, 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 go ahead. Long, but your, ahead. Your, your, your upper leg, you could say, yeah, but is it the upper leg lever 
totally horizontal? And I would say, yes, it's in the fully active position, but there's two things that magnify resistance. One is the angle of the lever relative to the direction of resistance. And the other is the length of the lever. The longer the lever, the more magnification, the shorter the lever, the less the magnification. So what happens when you have two levers that are working at the same time, and what I mean by that is the gluteus is moving the primary lever, which is the femur, the upper thigh bone, Mm -hmm. But you're not applying the load to the femur, you're applying it to the foot, which is at the end of the secondary lever. And that secondary lever is undercutting the primary lever and it's reducing its length. So what you would actually do is instead of saying you have a 18 inch or a 16 inch lever on your gluteus, you would draw a line up from the heel straight up and it would land somewhere in the middle of your femur from there to the hip is the actual length of your femur. So you've reduced its length, reduced its magnification, and had now to compensate for it by putting more weight on your spine, which is also not a good idea. In the meantime, your spine, your torso is leaning farther forward than your lower leg is, which means it's more active than your lower leg is. And it's longer than your lower leg is, which means the magnification you get into your lower back from a squat is more than it is for your quadricep. And yet you're doing it for your quadriceps. Mm. So, so you said it's for your mostly for your back. The, is yeah. it, is the, that what, you, what I'm saying is when your torso leans farther forward and it's mm -hmm. longer, it's loading the lower back more. I see. Then it's then that exercise in your lower leg is loading your quadricep because it's tilting farther forward and because it's longer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And yet you would say, well, I'm not doing this to work my lower back. I'm doing this to work my quadricep. And I would say, well, not only is it foolish because you're getting a tremendous reduction of the percentage of the load. And before I go on, let me just say by percentage, what I mean by that is, you know, people like the squat because they think that it lets them load the muscles more. I would say, no, the reductions in the mechanical arrangement there is forcing you to use more weight in order to compensate for the reduction. You must use a heavier weight in order to compensate for the reductions. Otherwise, you're not going to get as much quadricep load as you could get. So someone could say, well, I can't do a leg extension with as much weight as I can squat. Well, that's because it's a much more efficient mechanical system. You're, you're applying the resistance perpendicularly to that lower leg, not at a 30 degree angle. So you're going to get a, a bigger percentage. Is there can we relate this directly to the growth of uh, like the muscle? Is that, so what you're saying is that even if you're, you loading the weight in a re percentagely reduced exercise will be the same output that you would, you would get if you didn't, you know, put that extra weight on and just did the exercise, did an exercise that would fully load that muscle. Is that okay? Let me let me put it in a simple way. Mm -hmm. We can all agree that more load means more growth. If you load a muscle with 100 pounds, it's going to grow a little bit. If you load it with 150 pounds, it's going to grow more. Right. Assuming you can do in, enough repetitions, right? Assuming you're not you know doing a one rep max. Anyway, so yes, we can agree with square one. Square one being more muscle load equals more muscle growth. But you can actually get more muscle load using less weight with a different exercise that has more efficient mechanics. So I'll give you an example. Let's just say, and these are very rough numbers because this is not trigonometry class, okay? But you'll mm -hmm. get what I'm saying. Okay. So let's just say you're a 200 pound guy and you're gonna put a 200 pound barbell on your back and you're gonna do a barbell squat. We can actually kind of quantify how much load how much resistance your quadricep is getting. The first thing we do is we say, okay, you, you've got a 400 pound total. You're gonna to divide that in half because you have two legs. That's 200 pounds per leg. You're gonna multiply that times the length of your lower leg, which is, I forgot, I didn't I don't have my book in front of me right now, but it's, let's just say it's 16. Mm -hmm. So you multiply your 200 times 16, and then you're gonna multiply times a percentage, a percentage that, that reflects the degree, how far it's gone from neutral towards, right? So is it half, halfway? Is it a third? It's about a third. 
So we're gonna say 200 times 16 times 30%. Therefore, each quadricep will be loaded with about 915 pounds of resistance. We can play with these, the math, right. right? Okay. If you were to do a sissy squat, no additional weight, it's just your body weight, you weigh 200 pounds, and you were to lift that lower leg, get all the way horizontal like you're doing a, a limbo dance, mm -hmm. right? Okay, same math. You weigh 200 pounds, two legs is 100 pounds per leg, times 16, the length of the lower leg lever, times 100%. You'd be getting about, I think it's 1,200 pounds of load per quadricep. Wow, okay. That's so more load. Yeah, so is, that, so is that why like a sissy squat, that's why you feel that like, really tight tension yeah. yeah i mean you can get a guy that thinks he's a beast who squats you know 400 pounds and he'll still struggle with a sissy squat mm -hmm. and the reason is because you're getting a very small percentage of the load on a squat on the quadricep but on mm -hmm. a sissy squat you're getting not only you're getting 100 percent of the available resistance but you're also pretty much using only the quadricep you're not involving the glutes either Right. So is so are there so is the sissy squat like the best exercise that you can think of under your principles to to use to develop the quadricep? Well, let's put it this way. Any exercise that gives you a perpendicular resistance on the lever being operated by your target muscle is good. Mm -hmm. It could be a sissy squat, could be a leg extension, could be a pendulum squat. There's a number of these. So what you have to do is you have to say, what is the direction of the resistance? On a pendulum squat, it's like this, right? Mm -hmm. Right, because if you're holding, let's say a TRX, right? And so now you would, you would literally, if you wanted to take a compass, you put the point of the compass on where that rope is, and then you just draw a circle and that's the direction of resistance. And you notice that that direction of resistance crosses the lower leg far more than it crosses the upper leg. And that means you're loading the quadricep with a bigger percentage of the resistance. There's actually 16 factors that determine how good an exercise is. One of the 16 is how perpendicular is the direction of resistance to the limb being operated by your target muscle. And then are, there, the are there any benefits to doing compound movements like the squat or the deadlift or anything like that, um, that is offered to an individual outside of doing it the way you're proposing which is you know the keeping your lever perpendicular or horizontal uh, that is a that is the question right that that mm -hmm. is an important question and i'm going to give you the answer and it should tell you so much about what is smart and was what is not smart when you're doing a compound exercise let's just say three different muscles are working at the same time right they're mm -hmm. all contributing force to the movement of this particular weight. But each muscle that's working doesn't know whether other muscles are working or not. It just has its job to do. If I was the quadricep participating in a squad, my job is to extend the knee. Do I know the glutes are also working or the spinal? I don't know, I don't care, right? Their, their participation doesn't help me at all. I don't benefit either, you know, from a muscular standpoint or from a mechanical standpoint by the fact, I don't know that they're working. I just have my job to do. So one of the questions we have to ask is when you're doing a, a compound exercise and three different muscles are working, those three muscles have a different capacity, right? So the thought that each of those participating muscles would each be conveniently working to their maximum capacity is already foolish. Mm -hmm. Right, because can, one could be working too much, one could be working too little based on its individual and its own capacity. Right, all, all you know is that you're trying to get that thing to go up and down. In some cases, you're overloading a muscle and underloading another muscle. Right, so mm -hmm. you know, a lot of times we see these illustrations where a guy is doing a barbell squat and you see the quadriceps are red and the glutes are red, it's a black and white drawing otherwise, and the erector spinae are red. And so we look at that and we think, oh, the light is on or off. No, it's degrees. It's a dimmer switch. It's e degrees of on or off. So we need to be aware of the fact that when you're doing a, a, a squat, your quadriceps may not be working to their capacity because you might be limited by the strength of, let's say, the erector spinae. Right? So something might be the limiting factor. And it might not be the quadriceps.
that's keeping you from using more weight. Anyway, so let mm -hmm. me get back a little further. So yeah, yeah, go ahead. Each of these muscles are working in their own little world to their own individual capacity. And so the question you have to ask yourself is, um, the degree of force, the degree of, of uh, intensity that that quadricep is producing during the squat, how does that compare with how it would work by itself? And that's all the quadricep cares about. Am I getting maximum capacity? Am I getting early phase loading? Am I getting, you know, there's a variety of things that it wants, full range of motion. There's a lot of things it wants in order to determine whether or not it's going to maximally benefit, right? All you care about is getting from point A to point B, but you may not be paying attention to whether that muscle is getting the best it would get as compared to separate exercises. Okay, so that's number one. Number two is there's a neurological factor involved here. That's one of the 16 also. It's called reciprocal inhibition. So reciprocal inhibition basically just means that the body is designed to not allow two opposing muscles to work at the same time. So when you're doing curls, you're not paying attention, but the fact is your triceps are completely shut off by your central nervous system because it registers activation in the bicep. It doesn't want any, inter any interference. And so it literally shuts off any activation for the tricep, that's called reciprocal inhibition. I'll give you an example of that right now, which is kind of fun. Okay, so right now I'm gonna, my arm is bent. Uh -huh. I don't have any weight in my arm, right? Right, I'm gonna tap my bicep. My bicep is not as, as tense as it would be if I was actually holding a weight, right. but you can see the degree of relaxed it is. Okay, watch what I'm gonna do now. I'm gonna push down on my leg. Let me push this down a little bit here. I'm gonna push down on my leg. I'm gonna activate my tricep and watch what happens to my bicep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It literally turns to rubber. Yeah, complete relaxation. Okay, so that means that when you do a squat and you activate the glutes, which are hip extensors, you deactivate the hip flexors. There's four primary hip flexors one of them is the rectus femoris, which is part of your quadricep. It's that middle muscle. It's, it's about 20% of your quadricep. You're trying to maximally stimulate your quadricep and 20% of it is being shut off because you're trying to activate another muscle at the same time. So not only does, it not, does the quadricep not benefit by the activation of the glutes, it actually suffers a consequence because of the activation of the glute. So, that's inter that's re interesting. Uh, that live example right there with your bicep really kind of hits it home. You can try it at home yourself. You'd be surprised. Yeah, yeah. That, and then, well, it makes sense, but we don't think about it in the as far as weightlifting is concerned, yeah. right? Like currently, I'm in um, anatomy uh, and physiology uh, courses. Uh, preparing for a program and you know the way things move it's like the way you explained it we understand it in the in the sense of books right but we don't uh, but we don't necessarily transfer that to training to and i want yeah. yeah and i wonder like what that like where's the disconnect is it just because people have been doing it this way for a long time so it's the, the neck you know we just keep doing it as others have or like why why has this not caught on as yeah, much there's, as there's just... a lot of you know one of one of my i have uh, 10 endorsers phd endorsers mm -hmm. and one of them is a psychologist and another one is a sociologist and the reason i wanted them to review the book is because there there's an entire chapter dedicated to this closed-minded dogmatic thinking right and it, it it's just so happened that you know when weight training started it's a fascinating story. When weight training started, it was really just strength exhibition, right? You were just trying to impress people for money, right? And then a lot of those exhibition lifts, circus acts, mm -hmm. turned into power lifts for the sake of comparing, right? Our competitive nature said, well, I can lift an elephant, but we're never going to get two elephants that weigh the same thing and have the same. So let's just standardize this thing and get, you know, a barbell that has the mm -hmm. same size and shape and weight. And so we can standardize it and then we can compete, right? So in the beginning, in the early 1800s, um, it was all about trying to compete and, and establish superiority. So um, 
there was a, the early early fitness magazines they called it physical culture. One ban had a banner at the bottom that said, "Weakness a crime, don't be a criminal." So they were equating strength with morality. Mm -hmm. So it was all about it was not only about being strong; it was about demonstrating strength. And how do you do that? One rep max something. Mm -hmm. Heaven forbid you do a an isolation exercise, which doesn't allow you to lift much weight at one time, or b that you do something for high reps. Right, because it was all about demonstrating strength. You're not going to demonstrate. I mean, maybe if you were doing chin-ups, you can compete for how many chin-ups you could do or something. But it was all about competition back then. So what is amazing to me is the stupidity, the lack of logic, where someone would say, wait a minute, if a muscle is loaded and it's maximally loaded, but it's the only muscle working at this particular moment, why wouldn't it be getting stronger? Mm -hmm. Does it have to work together with other muscles? In order for it to be getting stronger, if you challenge a muscle all by itself without any other muscles participating, it's going to respond to the load. It's not, it doesn't care how much weight is actually being lifted. It doesn't even know how much weight is actually being lifted. Right. So, so that's how this this nonsense kind of started. And so now, and now we're just kind of like part of the. It, it's the it's a whole culture now, right? So like, and you're essentially just trying to like educate people on, on you know, it's it's got to be tough, right, for you because it's like you're fight, It almost feels like you're fighting like an uphill battle with this. Yeah, let me let me give you two little bits of insight here that I think you know help. Number one, mm -hmm. in the early 1900s, there was a, a um, an anatomist named Lombard. And this is called the Lombard's Paradox. And so Lombard, as an anatomist, knew that the hamstrings participated in hip extension. So he knew glutes participate, hamstrings participate, adductors participate, three muscles participate in extending the hip. So he was watching somebody squatting, and he says to himself, that's bizarre because the knee is extending and the hip is extending. But if the hamstrings are working because they're participating in hip extension, that means that muscle is tensing. And if it's tensing, it tenses on both ends. It would also be trying to bend the knee. But yet, if it was trying to bend the knee at the same time the quadriceps are trying to straighten the knee, then theoretically squatting shouldn't be possible. There would be a tug of war between the hamstrings and the quadricep, and the knee would never get extended. That's why it was called at the time Lombard's paradox. Then, like five years, 10 years later, this other guy came along, King Sherrington. And Sherrington was a, an anatomist neurologist. And he's the one who first discovered that the hamstring shuts off mm. when the quadricep is activated because of reciprocal inhibition. Yeah. to allow the knee to extend. Right, right. In other that words, total, total here's the sense. thing is, imagine your body is, is, is going through a thought process and you're doing your, your squats and your hamstring wants to participate, all right? But the body says, wait a minute, wait a minute. I can extend this hip just with the, the glutes and the adductors. I don't also need your help, Mr. Hamstring. In the meantime, the quadricep is the only thing extending the knee. All right, so I can't afford to shut off the hands, the, the quadricep. I need the quadricep to do the, therefore you, Mr. Hamstring, you have to be the one that shuts off. Mm. You're the least vital in this particular motion. So therefore you're the one that gets selected to shut off. Same thing with the rectus femoris. The, 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 the body says, well, I can still extend the knee with these other three of the four quadricep muscles. I don't need the rectus femoris, but I can't activate the rectus femoris at the same time that I'm activating these hip extensors. So that's, that's an important thing to understand is that people can't be dog. And by the way, there are physicians, there are PhDs in, in physical therapy that will tell you right now that when you squat, there is co-activation, quote unquote, of the hamstring and the quadricep. And that's why it's safer for the knee than a leg extension. And yet you'd say co-activation isn't possible because of reciprocal inhibition. You cannot get two opposing muscles to contract at the same time. It doesn't happen. 
so what so what would drive someone with that high of an education and you would think would know um you know how these things work like to make a comment like that is there are there studies that have like led them to believe that that might be the case that there's co um you know co-activation or no you know it's it's funny it's it's almost like convenient convenient blindness like you know there are p there are phds in excess physiology that have acknowledged that the rectus femoris shuts off they've done emg studies they can see that the rectus femoris shuts off during squats and leg presses any compound exercise involving the glutes and the quadricep shuts off the rectus femoris so what do they say Therefore, you should supplement that with leg extensions or sissy squats. Mm. And I would say, why, why would you supplement it? Why would you, not, why would you not just do the exercise that gives you full activation? Right. When you're that doing an exercise like a leg extension or a sissy squat, the participation of the other three quadricep muscles is no less than it is when you're doing a squat or a leg press. Why don't you just do the one good exercise? And then people say, well, a compound exercise saves time because you work multiple muscles at one time. And I would say, well, it would, that would be true, sensibly true, of course, if all three of, or all the muscles that are participating are getting the same amount of benefit they'd get individually. But you know that's not true because you then do, in addition to your compound exercise, a separate glute exercise and a separate quadricep exercise. You know this wasn't enough. That's why you do these other ones. So when you talk about the sissy squat, are just to make sure we understand each other. Um, what about the machine that you'll see? Um, it's not really a machine, but it, there's a padding that goes like in front of your shins, I believe, if that's the way it's set up. And oh, it I think you're talking about, yeah, the, the sissy squat bench. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's you're what it's going called. like this. Right. You put your legs in it and then you sissy squat using Yeah, you, you have a pad on, on, in front of your ankles and a pad right. behind the top part of your calves. Right. So like, is that beneficial or would you prefer that that's not even used when you do it? That's beneficial. Now, the thing that's important about that is I just got done saying a little while ago that when you're doing a squat and your lower leg is vertical, it means your quadricep is neutral. Right. So someone could look at that and they could say, well, the four, the lower leg is, is vertical the entire time. That means it's not working. The no, no, no. You don't even realize it. You've just changed the direction of the resistance. When you were squatting, the direction of resistance was vertical. Now you've, because of the way you've arranged it, now you've created a circular direction of resistance, right? So when, when you drop back, what you're actually doing is you, you're pushing forward against your ankles, right? And so you, the, the, it's called ground reaction force. The opposing force is going forward against your ankle because that's the direction you're pushing, mm -hmm. right? So that's why it's, it's, it, it activates the quadricep. Now, if you just uh, kept your torso vertical the entire time, so you just kind of went like this, mm -hmm. right? Then you're basically dealing with the magnification of the femur length. But if you went like this, right? Now you're adding to the to the magnification because you're making your torso part of the lever, part of the femur, and that's so now you've more than doubled the magnification. See, that's why it's so much harder on the quadricep to go back instead of keeping it vertical. When you're keeping it vertical, you're just keeping it, you know, you're keeping it to the length of the femur. And if you lean forward, you're doing what you were doing before, which is you're doubling over that primary lever and reducing it even farther. So I always think it's dumb when someone takes a barbell, they put a barbell on their back, but then they lean forward. Mm -hmm. It's like you don't even need the barbell if you don't lean forward. Right, right. Just lean back a little bit. Yeah, that's interesting. So um, to your point, as far as um, the the best exercise would be the isolating exercises, like as you brought forward and having the maximum amount of load per muscle. Um, are there risks involved with that? We just talked about how, you know, I mentioned it, I believe that when I do a sissy squat, it's the tension is so vast compared to like other exercises like the squats. So are, is there a risk in, you know, tears? Is there higher risk putting that much load on, on a muscle as opposed to, um, like a squat where yes, you do have some, you know, you, you do have some, um, reduction, but is that reduction helping you from bit from getting injured? Can you talk about that? Yeah. Well, look, I, I just got done explaining that you could load your quadriceps with 914 pounds or whatever it is, 15 pounds. If you're squatting 200 pounds, mm -hmm. or you could load your quadriceps with 1200 pounds on a sissy spot, which is your body weight. Right. So, 
So yes, there's a big difference between 914 pounds and 1,200 pounds. Um, but um, if 1,200 pounds is too much for you, then sissy squat is not the right exercise for you. Mm -hmm. Now, what I, what I explain to people is, um, as I said, there's 16 characteristics, 16 factors. They're on my website. Just go look at the 16 factors, and it explains all of them. Um, one of the 16 factors is that the amount of resistance that you have available to you at this particular moment for this particular exercise be within your grasp. If you were to walk into a room and your intention is to do a flat dumbbell press, even though a flat dumbbell press is a perfectly good exercise, the only weight that's on the rack is a pair of 70 pound dumbbells. It's not okay to do a 70, a, 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 you know, a flat dumbbell press with a pair of 70 pound dumbbells if you're not capable of doing it. Therefore today, that's not a good exercise mm -hmm. under these circumstances. If your body weight is too much for a deep knee sissy squat, then that's not a good exercise for you today. So then I would recommend a body weight pendulum sissy squat. That you can easily do. You can take that all the way to your calves, touch your hamstrings, because now some of the resistance is being taken up by the rope, by the fact that you're pulling against that rope. So you could get 50% of your body weight on a, on, a, on a pendulum sissy squat instead of your whole body weight. So essentially, that's the equivalent of you using smaller dumbbells in the, in your illustration. Uh, like when I, do my, when I do my pendulum sissy squat, I wear a 40 pound vest. Mm, and okay. so for 40 pound vest with a pendulum squat for 20 reps fries my quadriceps. Okay, so it's just a matter of getting the math right, right? What is the reduction plus the addition of weight you need to add to get it so that 15 to 20 reps results in a, in a, in a two failure set? That's the perfect amount of resistance to be using for muscle growth. So you just mentioned uh, to a failure set earlier, you did mention about volume. Um, we didn't go into it, but what do you feel about volume? Do you feel like with the kind of, you know, um, exercises you're recommending, do you need a higher volume to grow or can you do, um, you know, just a maximum load a couple of times and, you know, per body part? Well, if you're going to do, let's just make the assumption that you're going to do all the best exercises. And by best, I mean, they're the ones that have the most, the best efficiency. That means you get the most muscle load with the least amount of weight used. That's a matter of efficiency. Then you have efficacy or productivity, right? So that means you have early phase loading, you have full range of motion, you have no interference with reciprocal inhibition, you have no bilateral deficit, you have no active or passive insufficiency. All of these things that would detract, they've been eliminated. You've got just the right exercise that means you're going to get the most amount from that set. Then the question is, how much intensity should you use on a set and how often should you do it? And that obviously ties into the number of sets. So just push aside that idea of the best exercise because that obviously helps you maximize the benefit from an exercise. But the, what you ask is a very good question is volume. How much volume is enough? Okay, so... Um, this is this is a fascinating, fascinating subject because, again, I think most of us have missed the point for decades, and that is we focus more on volume, more on intensity, and less on frequency. We've sacrificed frequency for mm. intensity. So we, I, I say we've gotten greedy. We thought more sets with more weight was a solution. The problem is when you do more sets for a given muscle during a given workout, then you obviously can't do as many muscle groups during that one workout. If you're doing 10 or 12 sets for one muscle, how many muscles can you do at 10 or 12 sets in one workout, right? So you end up splitting this thing into either a four-way or a five-way, maybe even a six-way split, which means now you're working that muscle again once every five, six, seven days, right? So mm -hmm. the question we should be asking is, is that enough frequency? Turns out it's not. There was a study that was done and the study was, you know, what is the most frequent that you can work a muscle and still benefit from it? What is the, what would the theoretical ideal frequency? And Chris Beardsley uh, reported on, I don't think he did the study, but he was reporting on it. And basically what he said is when you do a workout, there's three things that your muscle has to recover from before it's ready again for another workout. One of those things 
requires maybe a few hours to recover. Another thing takes maybe like 12 hours. And the other thing takes about 30 hours. The last thing is muscle damage. So theoretically, you could work um, another muscle again 48 hours later, which is every other day. Now, the question is, how much intensity can you use in a given workout for you to not need more than 48 hours? I find it twice a week is better because it's more sustainable. So let's just for the moment say that the thing that has to be arrived at first before anything else is the ideal frequency. And I think it's twice per week, every third day, which means that the last workout you did has to be intense enough and brief enough to allow you to recover maximum stimulation, but recover in time for the ideal. Because what happens is that super compensation phase, when you first work out, you're starting at a baseline, you get a drop in strength, then it goes super compensation, it starts to rise in strength and size, it gets to the top, and then it starts to come down again. So by the time that super compensation phase comes back down again, it could be about a week. So if you're working one muscle every body part every week, once a week, that means you're kind of starting over each time. You're, may, you're maybe got 10%, 15% gain from the last workout, but you pretty much lost it, right? So what you want to do is you want to get it at the peak before it's lost much, if anything, and then send it up again, and then send it up again, and then send it up again. So you're better off doing one set per muscle, per workout, if that's what allows you to do the frequency of three times a week, then you are doing 10 sets once a week. Interesting. That is very controversial in the environment that we live in. Let, uh, let, me, just, let me just say, you've heard this thing about sets per week, right? Someone mm -hmm. said the science says 12 sets per week is optimal. Mm -hmm. You know what that's like? That's like me saying to you, here, take this medication. I want you to take 700 milligrams a week. I want you to take... Uh, uh, 2,800 milligrams a month. Mm. You'd say, you mean all at once? <laughs> right? I mean, yeah. the dose at a moment matters and the frequency of that dose matters. So when I right. say four sets twice a week, I don't mean eight sets a week. I don't mm. mean 32 sets a month. Right? So this idea of like trying to figure out a number of of sets per month, no, the, 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 the pristine amount of dose for one session, it's like a drug. It's like you're going to give that muscle a dose. It can be too much. It can be too little. It's got to be just the right amount and then just the right amount of frequency. And then you're going to get the greatest growth. But if you do too much, now you have to stretch out the frequency. You've lost the ideal frequency now. Yeah, because I mean, to your point, most people would say, oh, well, I need a week to recover from the harsh, you know, workout that, yeah. that I've had, you know, to so then I can hit it again, just as hard. What you're saying is you're catching it as as it's dropping back to baseline. Totally. And so you're really just not benefiting from. Yeah, if, if, if you think that you can afford a longer rest time just because you increase the intensity, of that set and everyone seems to be focused on four strep drop sets you know uh deload sets you know all these things to increase the intensity well that only makes sense if you think you have unlimited amount of time to recover mm -hmm. but you don't have unlimited amount of time to recover you only have three days so any amount of intensity that is above and beyond that from which you can recover after three days is only going to hurt you it's not going to help look i i learned this firsthand I was doing this, you know, five-way split for the last five years. I competed in, in 2019 in the AAU drug-free universe. I won, but I was very unhappy with my condition. I thought I was too skinny and I was not, I was carrying the, the amount of muscle mass that I used to carry before. And I just thought it was because I was older, mm -hmm. right? So about November of last year, I, I almost gave up on the idea of gaining size and so I said, I'm just going to, you know, reduce the priority of that. I'm going to do three full body workouts, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, two sets of muscle. And then on the other days, I'm just going to do cardio. Mm -hmm. I went from 12 sets once every five days to two sets every two days. And my muscles exploded. They just grew like insanely. And I went two sets, really? And then I, then I, played around with it and I, and I came up to the conclusion that four sets 
every third day is actually better. But the temptation is always there to do more because we automatically think more is better. But if doing more sets requires longer rest time, then you've shut yourself in the foot. So, so in your, in your scenario, the way, you know, you're suggesting to work out, you would be hitting every body part on, so every fourth, like, or the third, every day. third day. So Monday and Thursday would be the same workout. Got Tuesday it. and Friday would be the same workout. Wednesday okay. and Saturday would be the same workout. Got it. So you can do like, you know, your biceps, triceps on one day, and then every third day you do bicep triceps again, so to speak. Right. 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 Okay. So I, I do six body parts on Monday, which is six exercises. I do six body parts on Tuesday. I do eight body parts on Wednesday. And then I repeat Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and I skip Saturday. I skip Sunday. Mm -hmm. um, but I just, I just got done writing an email to someone and I said, you, you really have to prioritize the frequency thing. If you have a hard time recovering, then the solution is not to take longer rest days between workouts. The solution is to do fewer sets per workout and keep the frequency. Mm -hmm. So constant stimulation essentially is what you have. Yeah, that, you know, we, <laughs> it's been underneath our nose this whole time, but we're so egocentric. Mm -hmm. We're so concerned about, look, when I was starting out in the 80s, that was, you know, the Arnold Schwarzenegger, Frank Zane, you know, Colombo days. And, and, and everybody was doing a three-way split back then. The difference is that everyone foolishly thought that each muscle needs three or four different exercises. And so naturally you were doing, you know, 15 sets per muscle group. I think back now and I think, how the hell did we do 15 sets per muscle group and still work our entire body in just three days? I mean, I guess that's what, that's what happens when you're only 20 years old, right? <laughs> but, but at least we had the frequency right. And now I think we're getting smarter and smarter about using maximum intensity. And by that, I mean, closer to fatigue. Do you we want me to tell you about high reps versus low reps? Yeah, definitely, definitely. So there was a study that was done that um, suggested that you could get equal amount of growth with high reps or low reps by way of a slightly different mechanism. So if you're doing um, an exercise of 30 reps, which constitutes a weight that is about 40% of your one rep max, you can get equal amount of muscle growth with that set than you can with a set of six reps and a weight that is 80% of your one rep max. Now, some people might say, how is that possible? Well, if you, if you use a lighter weight, you don't get to the point where you have high fiber recruitment until you approach failure. Because when the muscle gets really, really, really tired and it's screaming with lactic acid, that's when it says, come on, all you fibers, come and join the battle. So that's what constitutes muscle growth. When you're using a heavier weight for fewer reps, you get a high fiber recruitment on the very first rep, on the second rep. On the, in other words, you don't have to take that six rep set to failure. They found that if you use a weight that's lighter than your 40% one rep max, then it drops off. So if you try to do the same thing with a, a weight that's 20% of your one rep max, you will not get a good result with that. But here's what's interesting is I'm an ectomorph and I did not grow well at all with heavy six rep sets. I did not. So I would say to you, I'm sorry, I don't care what that study says, but I get better growth with a set of 15 and 20 reps than I do with a set of six reps. Hmm. I just do. And when you do your sets of, I usually do 30 on the first set, 20 on the second, 15 on the third, 10 on the fourth, or you know, pretty close to that. In terms of a percentage of effort, I use about 85% on the first set, 90% on, on the second, 95 on the third, and 100% on the fourth, which basically means no reps left in reserve on the last set. One rep left in reserve on the, on, on the third, two reps in reserve on that second set, and maybe three reps in reserve on that first set of 30. But you're still burning. That muscle is still burning like crazy. Right, right. It, sound, it sounds like like you really kind of destroy your muscle pretty well on, the, on like the, the way you're, you know, described of working out are your, yeah. by the end of your workouts, you feel like, like you've done everything you can. Yeah. Like, is it that kind of feeling? And, and if you don't, you've done something wrong. Look, I, I, there are people that say I do 10 sets and I go, well, I'd like to see what those 10 sets look like. Cause I'll tell you, they, look, <laughs> they don't look anything like my four sets. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's uh, um, funny that you know people will say things like that, and then you're like, yeah, I'm, I don't believe that. I mean, yeah. like, there's something amiss, you know, there. So yeah, and the other thing too is people are obsessed with how much weight they use. Look, when I do my flat, actually, it's a slight decline dumbbell press. Mm -hmm. My first set is only 25 pound dumbbells. Then I go 35 pound, 40, and 45 pound dumbbells. And I usually fail at about 12 reps, maybe 13 reps with that 45 pound dumbbell. I could go to the 50 pound dumbbell, but the point is I don't care how much weight I'm lifting. Right. When I get to that 45 pound dumbbell set and I, and I blow it out, blow that muscle out to failure on my 13th rep. And I say to myself, would it have been better if I'd gone to the 50 and done mm -hmm. nine reps? The answer is no. In terms of muscle growth, it got just the same amount of stimulation for growth with a 12, 13 rep set with a 45 pound dumbbell because it's the intensity that makes that muscle grow, mm -hmm. not the weight. And if you start pushing heavier and heavier weight, you start compromising your range of motion. When I do those dumbbell, I go all the way. I mean, I literally pull my shoulders back mm -hmm. to get that maximum stretch at the bottom of each rep. I don't just you know stop shy of the full stretch. I literally pull, I arch my back, I get as much pectoral stretch as I can because it enhances the, the the stimulation to the muscle and the growth. So you're so you would be then judging by your by your description, you would be against the like short um, range movements. You, you you promote like full range as full as as full as you can, right? Well, there's degrees. Um, mm -hmm. Broadly speaking, full range of motion is better than partial range of motion, and partial range of motion is better than no range of motion, meaning isometric broadly speaking. However, um, it is true that the early phase of a range of motion is more valuable. That's where the muscle is stronger. That's where the muscle's strength curve, it's at its highest when the, when the, the, act, the, the, the uh, what's it called? The actin filaments are most mm -hmm. spread out and they have the most amount of recoil. Um, and so if you were going to compare, let's say uh, a two thirds range of motion bottom two thirds versus top two thirds, you're going to get much growth, much more growth on the bottom two third partial range of motion than you would on the top two third partial range of motion, even mm -hmm. though they're both two thirds of the range of motion. Right, right. right? Yeah. So if someone says I'm doing, you know, uh, I'm doing uh, 30, uh, 30 or two thirds of the range of motion, but I'm taking it all the way to the top. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, that matters less than whether or not you're taking it all the way to the bottom. I see. So yeah, at the, at the very end, you're getting less, you know, stimulation. If you want to muscle. cut off the last 10 or 20% of the range of motion, that's okay. Mm -hmm. Just don't cut mm -hmm. off the first, you know, 20 or 30% of the range of motion. That, that makes sense. That makes sense. So, uh, you know, this is so interesting. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm over here just kind of like trying to absorb everything. It's but cool the, stuff. It's yeah. cool stuff. I agree. But at the same time, I'm writing things down. When one thing that um, I, I wanted to kind of talk to you about was, um, so originally I'm from the Soviet Union and they were, you know, they're very, um, the Soviets are very good at weight, powerlifting, weight, lift, Olympic weightlifting. Right. And so they have this systems upon systems on how to get stronger. So my question is for someone that competes in like an Olympic style weightlifting setting or powerlifting, really would isolation movements like the ones you're recommending to put as much load on the muscles, would that help them in those lifts? So if they train the way you're suggesting, would then they benefit or get benefits in those particular lifts? Or would you say if you're doing that, then you might as well go ahead and squat and train the way you're going to compete in? Well, if you're going to compete in a squat, you're going to have to squat because there mm -hmm. has to be, you know, uh, proprioceptive learning of that movement, a coordination of that movement that is essential for executing that thing with maximum power. There's no doubt of that. You can supplement your squatting with isolated leg exercises, quad, glute, et cetera. Um, but, but what I would say is um, a couple of things. Those of you that are interested in powerlifting, you should read some articles by Chris Beardsley. And, and, and that's B-E-A-R-D-S-L-E-Y. Um, he has some fantastic articles. Uh, it's, they're very technical and you have to read very closely because sometimes it's not obvious which audience he's talking to. Is he talking to the muscle growth audience or is he talking to the speed athlete audience or the power audience? Um, 
Now, one of the things I've learned from his articles is that training to failure is not what you want to do if you want maximum power. Mm. Because once that muscle starts to get beyond a certain point and starts to lose its coordination, all hell breaks loose. <laughs> you have a, a negative return, right? So the bodybuilder would train to failure because it's best for muscle growth, right? So I don't train powerlifters, so I'm not a specialist in that. I do know that you would not train to failure. And I do know that you would do lower reps, heavier weight, because there's no doubt that that builds more absolute power, one rep, two rep, two, three rep power than doing a set of 20 to failure. Uh, and the frequency might be different. The frequency might allow longer time between workouts mm -hmm. for that muscle. Whereas in bodybuilding, it does not. But when it comes to the actual um, movement, a muscle doesn't know, again, whether it's participating in an isolated exercise or uh, a, a compound exercise. So let's just say you're working your triceps, right? If you wanna do a heavy, heavy, heavy set of supine or decline bench tricep extensions, and you wanna do it for four reps, right? You're still gonna use the same, the same thinking because again, that tricep is getting more benefit from a full range of motion than it would if you, it was doing a partial range of motion. Mm -hmm. By the fact that you're bottoming out, you're bending your elbow this much before starting at the top as compared to a bench press, which doesn't allow that much bend in your elbow, you're gonna get more benefit from the, from the deeper range of motion because the muscle doesn't know or care what you're actually doing. It knows what it likes, what it, what it benefits from. So, so speaking of triceps, would you say that that's probably the exercise or the muscle group that everybody kind of gets right? It seems like triceps, the, there's only one way to really train them that I see people train them is with the bent elbow, whether it's downward on the ropes or whether it's skull crushers like you, met, like you just showed, um, or do you see mistakes with that as well? I see mistakes. There, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll give you a couple of mistakes. Um, and this gets back to the early, earlier thing I was telling you about, which mm -hmm. is you know the pendulum the lever being either perpendicular or horizontal, I mean, vertical or horizontal. So let's just say you're going to do, you're gonna compare two tricep exercises and you're gonna see you know, which one gives you more load. You're gonna do parallel bar dips all the way to the bottom, full bend in the elbow. And you're gonna compare that to lying on, on a bench, skull crushing, okay? Now you can see easily that when you're doing parallel bar dips, your forearm, which is the operating lever of your tricep, never gets horizontal, right? You know that. Mm -hmm. You can see that it stays mostly vertical. It, in fact, I did this thing where I took picture after picture after picture and I put a protractor over it. And almost every single time that forearm dipped to about 10 degrees, 11, nine, right yeah. around there. So, we can do the math. Let's say you weigh 180 pounds. You've got 90 pounds per arm. Your length of your forearm is about a 12 to one ratio. Say, say 90 times 12 times 11%. The load on each tricep is gonna be about 120 pounds of load. And the energy cost to get that is 180 pound body weight. But you could take a pair of 20 pound dumbbells and you could do a skull crusher. And because the forearm gets horizontal, which is the 100% active angle, 20 pound weight times 12 times 100% is 240 pounds of load on each tricep, twice mm -hmm. what you got on the parallel bar dips. But you say, how is that possible? Parallel bar dips are so much harder. Well, they're harder overall, but they're not necessarily hard for the triceps. They're hardest for the front deltoid. Why? Because the upper arm is getting horizontal, mm -hmm. right? So that's one mistake is not understanding that getting a, a, a horizontal a perpendicular, uh, you know, uh, application of resistance on that forearm is really important for efficiency. That's number one. Number two is the resistance curve. So let's just say you're going to do a tricep kickback, mm -hmm. right? Well, you can see that when your forearm is hanging straight down, it's basically a pendulum hanging weightless. Well, that's when your elbow is bent and your tricep is relatively elongated. As you straighten your arm, and the tricep shortens and contracts, it loses strength potential, but the forearm is entering a more horizontal angle, which means you're getting more load where you're weaker and less load where you're stronger. Hmm. 
which is ridiculous. You, you, you get a completely backward resistance curve. Now you could say, well, I feel it. And, and I could say, yeah, but feeling has nothing to do with growth. You're gonna grow because certain physiological factors are met. And mm -hmm. one, of those, one of those factors is early phase loading. So I like that point that you brought up. Feeling doesn't equate to growth. And don't um, ignore the soreness. Yeah. And so, so in your, your point about like, well, it, it's harder because overall for you as an individual an exercise might be more difficult, but you're not able to differentiate that it's just difficult overall, but it's not necessarily difficult for the muscle right. that you're trying to work. Right. And I think sometimes people can get bamboozled by, you know, by, by just being fatigued totally. over the exercise, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Not only fatigue, but just how much weight they actually moved. Look how much weight I moved. Therefore, mm -hmm. each participating muscle must have been, you know, activated at its optimum. Well, let me ask you this. Bringing up feeling, how much weight, no pun intended, do you put on uh, like muscle and mind connection? A huge topic in the bodybuilding world. Do you think that's just kind of like a hoax or is there any legitimacy to it? Well, I think I probably translate mind to muscle connection differently than most people do. I think some people think of it almost as like you can actually wish your muscle to grow. <laughs> That's not what it actually is. What I think, what I refer to it as, you're paying attention to what that muscle is telling you during the workout mm -hmm. and you're making decisions based on that information. Right. So like when I work out, I work out in a garage gym. Mm -hmm. Right. And there's a, a music station there, but I usually don't want it on because I want to hear my breathing. I want to pay attention to what I'm feeling. And, and what I feel during this set right here is going to advise me what I should do on the next set. Mm. Right. So you need to, you need to ask yourself questions. Am I bottoming out? Am I maximizing the stretch? Am I pausing too long between reps? Um, Am I using enough range of motion? Am I, you know, using good form? I mean, these are all things that you need to constantly ask yourself. And a lot of people I see, look, I have clients. They just mindlessly, mm -hmm. I have this guy named Joey I train, and he always <laughs> uses these little itty bitty ranges of motions. And I say, Joey, go all the way to the bottom, all the way to the top. And he does it for like a rep or two, and then he goes right back to this again. You know, and I go, okay, I'm not gonna tell you a million <laughs> times, you know, I've, I've, I've served my purpose. You know, these mm. guys just think that as long as they go, it's like, you know, I, I was raised Catholic. People go to church on Sunday and they go, I've, I've served my duty. I don't actually have to repent. I don't actually feel, have to feel sorry for the sins. I, you know, mm -hmm. I, just, I, I served my, my, my time and I'm going to get the benefit. No, does it work that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> you're right. It is kind of like that. I've seen the same guys at the gym for years. And, you know, I'll look at them and they, you know, for 10 years, I've seen them there for 15 years and no change whatsoever. And I'm like, you're just wasting your time. You know, you well, just if I were to ask them, if I were to go up to those people and I would say, you know, tell me about your workout, they go, just, just my routine. Mm -hmm. I just got my, my lifestyle routine. Every day I do this and this and this. I come to the gym, I do my workout, I go home, take a shower, I, you know, have dinner with my wife. Yeah. And I'd say, but, you know, are you, um, ambitious do you feel like maybe you could be getting better results do you not care that maybe you're wasting time right. you know usually right. they don't care yeah it becomes part of their routine and there's That's no all it is. Yeah. yeah there's no like active adjustment no goal. Yeah. yeah there's no goal good that's a good point there's yeah. no goal well let me let me ask you this so we you know, we grew up, um, you know, I'm a little younger, but I still kind of grew up on the magazine, you know, world of bodybuilding and so forth. And we see people um, like Tom Platts, like Dorian Yates, um, particularly Dorian, from my understanding, uh, promoted that lower volume, heavier weight. And we see them looking the way they look. Uh, Tom Platts, obviously having the, you know, the larger legs. And so, what do you attribute that to? Do you, do you attribute to the fact that they're just, they're just genetic freaks and anything they'll do, they'll, you know, they'll get that growth or, um, you know, like, how do you feel about like those individuals? You well, know? I mean, genetics obviously is a factor. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, you could take a person, um, and have them train right alongside Tom Platts do the exact same exercises and they will not get, you know, Platts quadriceps, mm -hmm. right? So genetics is a factor. Um, what I always tell people is this, 
you know, when you look at someone on stage and he looks good, you know one thing for sure. They did enough things right to offset what they did wrong. <laughs> and they look yeah. good. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if you do an exercise that maybe rates, let's say, a four on a scale of one to 10, which means it contributes less, it doesn't mean it contributes zero, it contributes less than the exercise it is, it rates a 10 on the scale of one to 10. And it certainly does not undo some of the benefits of the tens, mm -hmm. right? So it just basically took more time. It was not an efficient use of your time, not an efficient use of your energy. But at the end of the day, when you get a guy who has great genetics and he uses enough intensity, maybe too much intensity, maybe he can tolerate too much intensity because he's juicing so heavily, um, he's going to get a good result. So we can't look at the person who has a great body and say, automatically that every single thing he did was optimally efficient. We just think he did enough things right to get a good result. The better question is, can you get as good a result training more wisely? And the answer mm -hmm. is yes. You can waste less time. You can waste, because again, you know, this thinking that um, the more intensity, the better. I just saw a guy post a thing on Facebook where he was saying, nobody trains harder than me. People think they train hard. They don't know what hard training is. And I thought to myself, you know, that's ego talking. Mm -hmm. That really is. That's a person saying that the harder you train, the more the growth. Well, guess what? There is such a thing as overtraining. Right. Right. There is such a thing as maybe training harder than you need to and still getting results, but getting being able to get as good a result with less effort. It's not a matter of machismo or guts. It's a matter of like, it's again, treat uh, exercise like a drug. Mm -hmm. You need a dose. You need the right amount of dose, a high dose, certainly a high dose at the right frequency. You can't overdose. You can't, you, if you do it every day or every week, you know, there's a right and wrong to all of this stuff. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when I was, when I was first uh, getting ready for Mr. California in 1982, I fell into that trap. I actually drew on a page, a circle. And in the middle, I put Mr. California. And then I put my name and somebody else's name and all the other people on the circle that I thought. And I said to myself, if we're all equally distant from the center, whichever of us trains the hardest will get there sooner. Mm. That's wrong. Yeah. That's simplistic, right? We're all starting in a different place. We all have different genetics, mm -hmm. right? And you can train too hard. Yeah, that that's uh, that's interesting. So like you're a believer in the fact that there that definitely is overtraining, right? Like you can sure. you, because some people will say that that there's no such thing as overtraining. That's just not, you know, not real. And so but but you say, yeah, you can't overtrain. Well, I just got done saying that if you train harder during one workout, then you can recover from in three days. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. You may not have overtrained to the point of making that muscle get damaged. But you certainly overtrained to the point of requiring a, a, a rest period that's longer than ideal. Right. Okay. okay. Right. So here's yeah. the other thing too is, you know, you know what breakdown sets are, deload mm -hmm. sets, sure. force traps, all that stuff. Okay. So all of these things are ways of making the exercise more intense, more fatiguing. Right. So let's just say I'm going to do a set of dumbbell presses and I'm going to take it to failure. I'm going to go till the last rep that I can go. That set will have created a certain amount of stimulation for my pecs. Question is, did I need more? Mm -hmm. Did I need a deload? I mean, if I deload, if I add another set, if I add some force reps, um, is that good? Because if it keeps me from being able to optimally work that muscle again in three days, then it's not good. Yeah, yeah. And I, I'm, as you were saying that, and, you know, earlier, I was thinking about somebody like a Ronnie Coleman, who obviously attributes a lot of his success to the amount of weight that he pushed and like, you know, volume, of course, he did that as well. And, but then I look at him um, now, and, you know, with all the injuries that he received from the amount of weight that he's put on his back, I, I, I can't help but wonder if more people trained the way you're stating, we would have less of those issues as we grow older, you know, because all that weight, you know, on your back is, yeah. uh, you know, could Look, be let me, let me Let me put it to you this way. Let's just say that Ronnie Coleman was here with me right now by my side. And this is, this is before he won all his Mr. Olympia contests. Mm -hmm. 
but he had two things then that he always had, and that is great genetics and the willingness to take whatever amount of anabolics he needed to take. Mm -hmm. And I say, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do these particular exercises, none of which include the compounds. We're going to fry each of your 20, 22 muscles every time we work them. Yeah. You, because of your genetics and because of the willing, your willingness to supplement, might well be able to do far more than four sets. You might be able to do 10 sets with that same intensity. And, mm -hmm. and because of your genetics and because of the supplementation, that's going to lead to more muscle growth. That's fine. I believe firmly that I could have, that I could have gotten Ronnie Coleman to get just as big as he got yeah. training that way. He didn't need a heavy spinal compression and all that stuff he was doing. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, well, that makes total sense. Um, well, Doug, I, I, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. That's that was a you know, pleasure. It's a big subject, right? Yeah, it's, it's a fun. huge subject. It's hard to cover in just a short time. Right. But I want to let you know, I'm, guys, I'm going to go ahead and link everything having to do with Doug here at the bottom of this video. Guys, if you like it, hit the subscribe button. And Doug, again, thank you so much for your time. Norman, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Greatly appreciate it. Bye, guys. Have thank a, you. Take care. Bye bye.